in, in this session, our first uh, presenter is Professor Nikos Leandros. Uh, Professor Leandros is a faculty member in the University of Pantheon, and he's also part-time teaching, teaching part-time at our university. He's going to talk about corporate strategies and the internationalization of media flows. The floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations to our heroic audience for being with us at this hour, half past four. Uh, during the last 20 years, uh, or 30 years, uh, media companies have changed fundamentally, radically. And I'm going to, to point out that this is a major factor behind the internationalization of media flows. Of course, there are many other factors, political, technological, uh, the advent of uh, macromedia, micromedia, but uh, the, the transformation of media companies, the transformation from relatively inward looking and specialized uh, entities, firms, to uh, conglomerates that uh, uh, diversify their activities and internationalize their products uh, is a major factor behind uh, what we observe today. Uh, this is something that continues and uh, will continue even further. And I, perhaps I'm going to point out that we are entering a new period in uh, recent years. So, uh, my presentation has two main parts. The first part is a discussion of, of this transformation, what has happened over the, the last three decades. And the second part is an example. I'll, I'll examine briefly, of course, the case of Bonnier, which is a leading Swedish company. And um, I'll show these trends and developments through the experience of this particular company. Uh, so, traditionally, throughout the 20th century and until the 80s, uh, media companies uh, were characterized by uh, certain, uh, uh, they had some distinct characteristics. This is the period of mass media, as became known. So. Uh, they produce for, for a much audience. So there is a product that is, uh, is not differentiated. Uh, you can reject or consume this product, but you cannot change it. So mass production, this means to a certain organization of production, uh, economies of scale become very important leading to integrated, to vertically integrated firms. So we have this typical model of, of industrial production. So for instance, newspapers that uh, uh, concentrate within a single firm, both the, the actual, the production of, the writing of, of, of the content, the production of content, um, and uh, so everything is, is part of the same company. Uh, very big companies with hundreds of thousands of, of people. And at the same time, the media uh, industries, the media sectors are distinct. There is a clear distinction between uh, printing and even between printing for newspapers and periodicals and book printing and publishing. Uh, so, uh, book publishing is, is a distinct sector. Uh, printing of, uh, publishing of newspapers and, and periodicals is another sector of the economy. Uh, radio, uh, television, uh, cinema, music, all these are distinct industries. Of course, there are some links, uh, always, but in general, uh, they are different worlds. Companies, publishing companies, uh, are only publishing companies. Uh, 
in, in broadcasting, usually in Europe there are state monopolies, and this is a major uh, problem for private companies that cannot expand uh, into this area. Of course, there are uh, exceptions, uh, as I said, but generally there is segmentation. And uh, media companies are important politically, always, have always been politically important, but not economically important. They remain relatively small uh, and profits, uh, pro profit margins are rather small uh, because they, they don't have the possibility to expand into other sectors. And um, um, so they remain relatively small, they are specialized in their segment and they are inward looking. They produce basically for the internal market. Uh, this, this model uh, changed completely from the mid-80s and throughout the 90s and um, uh, of course in the, in, the, in the decade that followed, in the, in the 2000 decade, but as I will point out, uh, point out later on, uh, there are major new developments now. So I think we can identify a golden age of rapid expansion of media companies, internationalization of production, diversification across different products and different markets, uh, and uh, as I say, a golden age uh, from mid 80s uh, and for about 20 years, which is uh, a result of several socioeconomic and political developments. Uh, that led to the transformation of the strategies and structure of media companies. So, uh, the main factors behind this transformation are a series of technological developments, like photocomposition in the 80s, in, uh, in printing, uh, in publishing industry, in the newspapers in particular, but also the development of satellite communication and satellite TV, uh, digitization, uh, the internet later on, uh, all, all these developments on the one hand on many cases reduced the cost of production as in the case of photocomposition, improved quality of production and reduced uh, the cost of production uh, because uh, wages, labor costs in particular were reduced and at the same time they created new markets like satellite TV and uh, the internet. So many new opportunities. N new markets were created or the old markets were transformed in a favorable way. So we have favorable technological developments. Uh, also we have uh, favorable for the companies, I mean regulatory changes. We have the end of state monopolies practically everywhere. Uh, deregulation and, and privatization. So, um, in, in, in many countries there were many draconian laws uh, against uh, concentration of capital, especially in the industry, in the media industry, due to, to, the, to the dangers that concentration might create to pluralism uh, and the democratic process, but these uh, regulations uh, and these uh, obstacles uh, ra gradually they were reduced and the environment, the regulatory environment promoted business expansion and company expansion through other economic means as well. Uh, so we had business oriented policies in general and an apotheosis of, uh, of market forces and uh, uh, the importance of, of uh, uh, businesses, etc. Uh, the general economic conditions were also very favorable. In the, in the 80s and the 90s, economic growth uh, was more or less normal. Uh, it was a period of good economic growth. And what is even more important, much more important, is that uh, the, the stock exchange uh, expanded 
and, and, and shares, the value of shares increased very much. This created tremendous opportunities for, for media companies to enter in the, in, the, in, the, in the stock exchange and obtain a lot of cheap money, okay, much cheaper than to go to the bank and get a loan. But also, this was a period of rapid credit expansion through uh, the monetary policies that were followed and the policies of the banks that also uh, create, uh, gave many opportunities for, for credit, loans, and therefore expansion. And in addition, political developments were also favorable. We have the general process of globalization and uh, something that nobody really expected, uh, the so-called socialist world, uh, the Soviet bloc collapsed. So in Europe, many markets uh, uh, opened, created from, from nothing. Uh, and even in countries like China or Vietnam or, or in other countries, uh, there was a, a process of uh, um, privatization and therefore uh, opportunities for, for, media, for expansion of the companies. So, uh, political, technological, economic and regulatory developments were very favorable for, for media companies. And indeed, they were exploited by media companies. Uh, and a new mediatic environment has been created. Uh, we have the end of media scarcity. Today, there is practically an infinite number of media outlets. Uh, employment increased in, in this sector. I, I, I can also say that academic departments were also established, uh, a lot of academic departments, a lot of interest, academic interest as well. Wages and profits increased. Uh, media companies expanded and media companies became much more important economically and uh, started playing a, a more important socio-economic and political role than in the past in many countries uh, not necessarily everywhere uh, and so we have a different uh, a different type of, of media company that was formed during this period um, through rapid growth, uh, essentially by mergers and acquisitions, not so much from organic growth, but we have a, a, a series and, and a, a tsunami of mergers and acquisitions. Also, we have differentiation in different markets and in different countries and internationalization. So, we have a radical transformation of the typical uh, media company, uh, big and medium media companies uh, that were, as I said before, inward looking and national companies and specialized companies in one section of the industry, became multinational and promoted, started promoting the internationalization of media flows. Uh, I'm not going through that. This is a very, a very long uh, uh, um, table. I'm not going into that. Uh, this is just to show that uh, all major media companies uh, have activities, uh, as you can see, um, practically everywhere, everywhere, broadcasting, publishing, films, internet, music, um, and one can say also telecommunications, um, e-commerce now, culture, and so on and so forth. But uh, this is, this is uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, give, give an example. Uh, in one of these media companies, the famous news corporation owned by Rupert Murdoch. For instance, I looked at the revenues of, of this company in 2009, the most recent data that I got. This is a company that started in Australia. So this is the home country, uh, Australia. In, in the 80s, uh, or until the 80s, I should say, until the 80s was a company operating only in the newspaper industry. Uh, it owned a number of newspapers in Australia and in Britain. Sun, News of the World, um, and uh, New York, um, The Times, The Times of London. 
and uh, after that uh, in within 20 years it became a huge company with activities everywhere uh, broadcasting uh, uh, books uh, television radio internet etc and you can see that now Australia is only 8.2 percent of, of total revenues the UK is only 9.5 percent and uh, um, and there are revenues from everywhere, from all corners of the world. And also, um, newspapers, uh, newspapers and internet services, they give, they give us uh, the data together, uh, the revenues together. We, there is no uh, differentiation, but they are less than 20%. Um, and, of course, 80% is from other activities. Um, but uh, this, is, this is not an exemption. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, you shouldn't think that this kind of transformation from uh, uh, companies uh, operating in two markets and only in newspapers and periodicals uh, to a company that operates throughout the world and, and in all uh, sectors of media and beyond and culture etc uh, you shouldn't think that it's an exception perhaps it's extreme uh, you can we can see the phenomenon at the extreme but it's uh, similar processes and, and uh, similar process of differentiation and internationalization has occurred in uh, in um, in most uh, at least medium media companies throughout Europe and, and North America um, this, this, this was uh, the golden period um, and how this period transformed the media companies and of course media companies that we have today are based, are the results, are the products of, of these processes. But something else happened as well. Uh, from the early 21st century there is a revolution from below that threatens these, these companies. Uh, it started with Napster and peer-to-peer -peer communication in 2000, I think, uh, and basically it evolved through so-called Web 2.0, uh, blogs, wikis, social networking, uh, video sharing, Twitter, tags, and so on and so forth. In general, the possibility given to, to everyone to individuals to produce content and compete with authorities, media authorities, political authorities, academic authorities, uh, and disseminate this content to easily and without cost. Uh, production and dissemination. Uh, and also, um, so this is a major new phenomenon, uh, threatening the traditional gatekeepers as, and the traditional mass producers. And, of course, we have also convergence and the emergence of mobile platforms, which is also very important. As a result, uh, we have a new communication paradigm that is developing and evolving, characterized not by analog TV, as in the past, or by the world of the printed press, but by digitization, digital production, and, more important, networking and interactivity. Uh, so, a new communication paradigm um, and individuals are able to disseminate information, produce content and overcome high hierarchies and organize themselves horizontally. Uh, as a result, a very different media landscape is, is evolving because we are not talking about something that has been settled, we are talking about an unfinished revolution, a revolution in the making. Uh, and uh, so we have a different media landscape that is evolving. Uh, some of the characteristics of this landscape is the increased importance of uh, micro media, uh, and the fact that from a structured media environment, 
um, we are going, we, we are now to, to a rapidly change, changing and chaotic media environment. And also for the far, first time in human history, authorities and citizens coexist in the same information environment and compete for attention. Uh, so traditional media companies, despite their strength, the strength obtained in the golden era, today are threatened in their core business and traditional model, which is mass production of content. This is especially true for newspapers, as we know, and we see decline of circulation everywhere in the world, not everywhere, but in most countries of the world. Uh, but all media are affected. Broadcasting is certainly affected, both television and radio. Uh, and there is also decline of, of uh, uh, mass production of TV uh, through uh, new hubs and companies in developed countries, mobile platforms, YouTube, web radio, web TV. All these developments threaten uh, the traditional uh, media companies uh, publishing and broadcasting. Um, so, in this much more competitive and fluid and dangerous for the company's environment, uh, the companies have to compete and they try now to emphasize branding and economies of scope. Uh, I'll return to that and I'll explain it a bit better through the example of, of Bonnier. Uh, and there are similar developments in the advertising market and in general, there are two important issues emphasized by the companies now. One is uh, economies of scope and branding and the ability to evolve from a newspaper or from a TV company to a source of information okay, and exploit a, a strong brand to sell your product in as many media, as many as many countries uh, is possible and, as, and, and through many channels. So branding is very important and this multi-platform strategy is also very important. Uh, both these processes help and promote internationalization of, of media flows. So let's, let's make it a bit more uh, concrete with the, the case of Bonnier. Uh, a typical, um, I can say, uh, publishing company, big publishing company, uh, established in, 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 uh, in Denmark, um, in, in Copenhagen in 1804, uh, moved to Sweden a few years afterwards. Uh, in 1994, published Expressen, which is a leading uh, newspaper in, in Sweden and uh, so until the 80s uh, this was a, a big a very successful uh, newspaper company uh, operating only in Sweden publishing um, express and some periodicals perhaps an economic newspaper but a typical uh, successful publishing uh, newspaper company this has changed completely uh, during the last 30 years and uh, a, a radical transformation has occurred from a national publishing company to a multinational and multi-channel conglomerate. And today the, the, the structure of Bonnier is what you see in this diagram is, uh, is a conglomerate with 170 75 companies, so it's a group of companies consisting of 175 companies, operates, operates in 16 countries, and it has all sorts of activities, newspapers, business press, magazines, books, broadcasting uh, in several countries, films, and an expanding portfolio in digital services. So from a publishing company to, to a group of, of, of hundreds of companies operating in many countries. Um, just 
Uh, I'm not going into that very much, just to show to you that it's a very successful company as well. Uh, uh, you see that uh, from 2000, I looked at the data, uh, these are the net sales. So from 15 billion Swedish kronas net sales uh, increased gradually and they reached more than 30 billion Swedish kronas uh, in 2010. And uh, the operating profit is always positive, so there are good profits. It's, it's a big and successful uh, media company that is still a family company. Uh, it, in its logo it says that emphasizes family values. It's owned by the same, the same family, the descendants of course, but by the same family. Uh, but the internal structure is completely different. Um, and if we analyze uh, net sales by country, you see that, for instance, in 1998, um, in the 80s it was only Sweden. In 1999, 1998, it was 70% of sales uh, were coming from Sweden. In 2011, this percentage was down to about 55%. And of course, uh, it had uh, uh, revenues from Germany, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and many other countries. Um, and uh, um, so, because of this internationalization and diversification of production, a new mode of operation has emerged. And there is increasing emphasis in the production of content that can be used in different countries and transmitted through different channels. This is a quote from their annual report in 2005. And immediately afterwards, another quote from the annual report in 2011. So in 2005, they said, Bonnier Publications has successfully established an increasing number of titles with simultaneous publication in all of the Nordic countries. Several new magazines were launched during the year based on these cross-border operations. For example, Illustrated Videns Kam hist History in Denmark, Sweden and Norway, Spies Bedre in Denmark and Norway, and Tara in Norway, in addition, of course, to Sweden, which has a Swedish original. Uh, and concludes, the basic concept is the successful publication of cross-border magazines. So they are very clear. We are interested as a company to publish cross-border magazines. This entails a magazine being published simultaneously with largely the same contents in several languages and in several countries. This is, this is, uh, this is mentioned in 2005. And today, Indeed, they moved in that direction. Today, this, this uh, magazine is published in 21 countries and uh, has approximately 3 million readers worldwide. And six more magazines are published in the entire Nordic region and in some cases in other countries as well, basically the Baltic countries, etc. Um, so, in, 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 in 2000 and 2005, they emphasized cross-border operation. Uh, there is a major new development in recent years due to, to this new phenomena and, uh, that I've mentioned and the advent and the increasing importance of, of micromedia. Uh, they give much greater emphasis to integration of content across media, multi-channel operation. So, in 2011, they say, magazines are being transformed from individual products to brands that operate in many channels. The commercial element of this trend has been called 360-degree marketing or integrated sales. Bonnier-owned U.S. magazine Popular Science followed its pioneer spirit by being the first to launch ABC's so-called Consolidated Media Report. The new report provides advertisers with more detailed information 
concerning their print edition, tablet edition, the number of Twitter, Twitter followers, and the number of unique website visitors and Facebook fans. So it's important that this newspaper uh, also has uh, not only a present, but is increasingly able to promote its content through a strong brand name uh, in Facebook, Twitter, uh, tablet, um, blogging, and so on and so forth. This is the so-called 360 degree marketing or advertising. So not only, well, multi-platform with an increasing emphasis to, uh, social, to, to social media. Uh, and this is a, an international trend developing uh, across the world. This is an example, but I could uh, say the same things, or, well, similar things for many other companies. So finally, to conclude, uh, during the last decades, corporate strategies in the media sector have promoted internationalization and differentiation of products and markets. Thus, many previously inward-looking in specialized companies have been transformed into multinational conglomerates that include tens and hundreds of subsidiaries. This has promoted cross-border operations and the internationalization of media flows. The new media landscape promotes the transformation of previously specialized companies to content producers that operate across many different countries and platforms. Gradually, we are moving to a new phase, greater emphasis in integration and flexibility of content. Leading companies are transformed to global sources of information and entertainment. In a chaotic and increasingly competitive media environment, branding and multi-platform strategies become vital in order to lock in audiences and attract advertisers. Centrally produced content is disseminated across different media in a wider region or even globally. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Leandros, for this uh, stimulating presentation. Uh, now we have uh, Professor Naomi Sak from uh, Westminster University. Uh, she's going to offer us a comparison of Egyptian and Saudi Arabian uh, media. Uh, with a particular focus on the interplay of transnational and national interests in uh, the, uh, the media conglomerates of these uh, two countries. Is this, is this on? Uh, yep, is, is it on? Okay, that's great. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you ever so much to uh, Gokchen and Yashim and the university for the invitation and for the very good idea for this colloquium. Um, okay, so in this presentation, um, I'm going to explore two things. How do power relations work for Arab members of a transnational corporate elite? Do these individuals draw, on, draw their power from a national stage and is that translated into then transnational dealings or is it the reverse that they have status transnationally um, because of their position on the national stage or is it a bit of both so um, I, I want to sort of compare their, their kind of constructions nationally and, and transnationally um, and I also want to think about this idea about um, opening up national states, nation states where they're based. And I'm, I'm prompted to ask that question um, by um, a, a paragraph in the conference rationale that were the organizers sent us, um, in which they said, the, the transnational flow of cultures, finances, people, and commodities is now seeping through and disrupting the borders of even the most closed and detached societies. And I include Saudi Arabia. Um, perceptions of Saudi Arabia in that. Uh, furthermore, the multiplication of sources and receivers of these flows, the rapid decentralization and disordering of transnational and transcultural nodes, and the increasing accessibility, ease of accessibility to these nodes and flows by previously marginalized societies are all changing the 
cultural, political, and economic textures of geographies around the world. <clears throat> so a priori, it seems as though the media businesses of the men that I've chosen to discuss here have contributed to the multiplication of cultural flows. Have they thereby disrupted um, <clears throat> the borders of their societies? So I've chosen um, two media moguls. Um, the one on the left is uh, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal. Just bear in mind that he is a prince because it is relevant. And the one on the right is Naguib Sawiris of Egypt. And quite by chance, I hadn't realized this, it turns out they're both the same age. They're both 57. Um, Al-Walid turned 57 in March, and Sawiris will be 58 in June. But it's significant, the age, because if you think about the people who run the two countries that we're talking about, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, they're in their late 70s and 80s. So we're talking here about a different generation. Al-Walid is known for his Kingdom Holding Company, which is based in Riyadh and owns shares in um, companies in different sectors around the world. He's known also as the owner of Rotana Media Group, Risala Channel, and he's starting up Al-Arab News Channel, uh, which is going to launch in December this year. And he's currently ranked 29 in the Forbes Billionaire List. Um, now, Nagib Sawiris owns Oriscom Telecom, which has, or has had, holdings in a very wide range of countries inside and outside the Middle East. He also owns Egyptian channels on TV and on TV Live, co-owns a successful um, Egyptian independent daily and various other film and music ventures, and he's currently ranked 367 on the Forbes rich list. But I mean, if you can see that, you know, with three, you, you've got to have three billion dollars to, to count at that level. You know, we're, we're talking stratosphere here. And I mean, it's a bit crazy to try and cover both these people in one presentation, but I think the comparative perspective is interesting. Uh, because I want to start by trying to theorize, and I, I've illustrated this with pictures, not words, and um, to theorize uh, transnational nodes. Um, and this kind of picks up where Nikos left off, because the multiplication of sources and receivers of transnational flows presents a challenge to multinational conglomerates. And they have responded with forms of consolidation. Um, and Gareth Loxley, who wrote um, a, a working paper for the World Bank on media and development, um, pointing out that audience fragmentation had destabilized the traditional advertising-based business models, showed that this destabilization had prompted big players to form new alliances in the converged digital media space, and it had actually stimulated more concentration, okay, because we tend to think of there being less. And so um, Loxley employed the hourglass analogy to convey the workings of the international media sector, whereby you have a handful of media conglomerates at one end interacting through narrow channels with a very large number of small enterprises at the other. As he puts it, there's a very thin middle. And that offers us a backdrop against which to consider the position of uh, Arab media moguls. Where do they belong in this hourglass structure? Is it with the handful of global conglomerates? Are they part of this thin middle? Or, are, or should we see them and their enterprises um, with a very large number of small enterprises and individuals? If we take the uh, Mark Dews and um, Brian Stewart's kind of version of the hourglass model, um, is enterprises and individuals that are interacting with the big conglomerates. And the question ties in with that posed by scholars who've researched the transnational capitalist class, which is where do the interests of this class lie? Do they align by definition with those of the global conglomerates? Or should we be careful when we actually apply this concept of the transnational capitalist class? So I refer here to Stephen Vertovec, um, Actually, his book on transnationalism, published in 2009, is mainly about migration. Um, 
defining as a global scale intensification of certain kinds of relationships. I want to quote something he wrote in 1999 in trying to define transnationalism, which is, despite great distances and notwithstanding the presence of international borders and all the laws, regulations, and national narratives they represent, certain kinds of relationships have been globally intensified and now take place paradoxically in a planet-spanning, yet common, however virtual, arena of activity. And that is to say, as we all know, transnational is not international because transnational ties and interactions are not forged through governmental or official channels. If they were, we would call them international. So where does that leave us with these Arab mega capitalists? Is there some kind of uh, supranational space where members of the global corporate elite interact with each other irrespective of territorial borders? Well, according to Leslie Sklar, um, is precisely this supranational sp uh, supranational space that the tr members of the transnational capitalist class think they inhabit, and I think the emphasis there is on the word think. So there is one fraction of the. TCC, transnational capitalist class, the owners and controllers of the transnational corporations who have, in Sclair's words, outward-oriented global perspectives rather than inward-oriented local ones. They tend to share similar lifestyles, expen ultra-expensive resorts in all continents, private jets, etc. And they seek to project images of themselves as citizens of the world as well as of their places or countries of birth. And in Sclair's view, there is a particular discourse ideas around sort of international competitiveness and so on that constitute a weapon of the transnational capitalist class. And we see that discourse in arenas like the World Economic Forum at Davos. And I understand it was Samuel Huntington who coined the term Davos man to evoke a supposedly post-national global elite. But if we read Michael Lint writing in Salon.com just a few days ago, Davos man is going the way of Neanderthal man. He writes, when leading industrial countries rushed to bail out national firms in 2009, they gave the lie to the claim that major corporations no longer had national identities. The free flow of money, goods, and labor across national boundaries was never anything more than a utopian fantasy. And his points resonate with those of people like Sclair. And by the way, Sclair, I mean, who writes about the sociology of the global system, for him, the point of global system theory is precisely an attempt to limit drastically the theoretical scope of the concept of globalization. The same points resonate with um, the work of people like William Carroll, who's a Canadian, who with uh, co-authors measured the interpenetration of capital across the world's biggest corporations, uh, using cross-representation on those corporations' boards of directors. And according to Carroll, the notion that the elite is becoming disembodied from national moorings and repositioned in a supranational space underestimates the persistence of national and regional attachments. So how to oper operationalize this thinking in selecting and analyzing data about uh, Sawiris and Al-Walid? And there's an added complication uh, in respect of Al-Walid. It's more obvious there than with Sawiris because according to some approaches, transnationalism itself is the very tool of Saudi Arabian expansionism. And we heard reference earlier to the links with the Salafis and so on, which are not necessarily forged in the corridors of the Saudi foreign ministry. <clears throat> so Madawi al-Rashid, in her book, Kingdom Without Borders, suggests that Saudi expansion in politics, religion, and media has not emanated from official foreign policy, but is generated by people with or without official roles through transnational connections. 
which implies again that the vocabulary of transnationalism and globalism may mask or hide power interests that are embedded in or aligned with state territories. So we're dealing here with transnational practices that may not originate with state agencies or actors, but nevertheless may serve the interests of state actors. And these are practices, as Claire says, in the economic, political, and cultural ideological spheres. So I'm just going to run through some qualitative indicators for each mogul. Um, and clearly this note, I mean, they've got massive interconnections that make them eligible for membership of this global corporate elite. And I'm not going to elaborate on all of them. I'm sure you all know that there are cross um, shareholdings between Al-Walid's Rotana Group and Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation. And Al-Walid has been a staunch um, loyal supporter of the Murdoch family during the phone hacking scandal in the UK. You may know that Soweris has long-standing partnership with France Telecom in the Egyptian mobile company Mobinil and so on. But my interest is to weigh these men's, as I said at the beginning, but I think I said it wrong at the beginning, is to weigh these men's transnational and national interests and to discover if their transactions are disrupting the borders of their, of their countries of origin. So I'll take four areas of analysis, which is, which are the early origins of wealth, the way their actions have been legitimized nationally and internationally, and I call this the mechanics of uh, image building, um, how they use their wealth in the field of media and communication, and their statements on political openness. And um, I mean, clearly there'll be overlap in, in these indicators between uh, spheres of economics, politics, and cultural ideology. But first, since we are talking about opening up, I don't know if you can see that clearly, yeah. Um, let's check some comparative rankings for Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And the first thing to say about both countries, that they are key allies of the United States in, in the region. Um, but when we look at them in terms of um, press freedom rankings, not doing too well, both countries, um, despite the uprising and so-called Arab Spring, <clears throat> Egypt's performance on press freedom has um, radically deteriorated over the, uh, between 2010 and 2011. Um, both countries feature on the uh, Reporter Sans Frontieres Enemies of the Internet list. Egypt is simply under surveillance. And the, the sort of the benchmark, the touchstone of United Nations membership, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Saudi Arabia hasn't even signed it. Um, and then just a quick sort of um, comparison of. Um, internet use and cell phone access in both countries. Um, cell phones very important in Egypt. In Saudi Arabia, it's clear that everybody's got two or three. Um, <clears throat> and people using the internet, um, I mean, it tells you something that um, the, the, the levels are still relatively low, even though we're talking all the time about micromedia and so on. Anyway, so let's look at how um, Al-Walid took his first steps into the global elite. And interestingly, there are two versions of this. Yeah, One says his investment career started in 79. His dad lent him $30,000 and a house, and he mortgaged it, and he raised capital, and he's a workaholic and a self-made man. And and in 2010, he told an interviewer, I hate inefficiency. Everyone, everyone has to be efficient. I work more than anybody in my company. So nobody can come to me and say, hey, Prince, you know I'm overloaded. Because if I work more than you and I pay your salary, why can't you work like me, like her? I work day and night. So nobody can ever tell me, oh, I'm tired. I can't work anymore. 
And when if you read about him, you always hear that he sleeps between either 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. and 10 o'clock in the morning. That's all. The rest of the time he's working. The second version, which is the one, if I was going to tell a story, that's how I tell it, is that, yes, okay, he had ventures in construction in the early 80s, um, but he managed to achieve a controversial, hostile takeover of an ailing Saudi bank um, in the mid-1980s. And that's the kind of thing you can only do when you have kind of royal leverage. Um, the bank was on the verge of bankruptcy, and he was able to achieve the takeover with a minimum amount of equity. And he later told Riz Khan in his, bibliography, his biography, uh, we took it, the United Saudi Commercial Bank, we took it over because at that time, it put me in the middle of the business community. Because in the bank, you see everything. We became the eye of the hurricane, seeing everything. We began building connections with the business community. And that business advantage meant that um, Al-Walid was later able to invest half a billion in um, Citicorp, and as it were, the rest is history. He was still only 36 when he made that investment. And Dan Briody, who's written a book on the Carlyle Group in the States, um, shows that it advised Al-Walid on that purchase when it was still only four years old and George W. Bush was on the board at the moment of that um, involvement. And it seems as though that purchase did have support from Prince Sultan, who's um, father of the former Saudi ambassador in America and um, now Crown Prince. So Al-Walid consolidated his um, business interests as Kingdom Holding Company in 1995. Again, the royal pedigree, you know, is important. If you're going to call your company Kingdom Holding, you wouldn't be allowed to do that in the UK. I think mean, certain people can say royal in the UK. Um, in 1997, he started accumulating stakes in a range of companies, News Corp, Time, Warner, Walt Disney, etc., um, came to the rescue of Euro Disney. And this is important in his um, image building. He's obsessive, as we hear from the people who, are, who know him, interact with him. He's obsessive about his image scrutinizes every word of every article that's written about him and has a video team film uh, his interviews. <coughs> his businesses um, produce a stream of press releases which are routinely picked up by the US and European business press, especially those outlets where he has a shareholding or an alliance, as in the case of um, Bloomberg. Um, so the thing about Saudi Arabia is that it's had to kind of burnish its international image um, since 9-11. So Al-Walid is kind of convenient um, as part of that sort of modern face of the country. He's a vocal advocate of reform and a staunch ally of the US. The fact is that he could never hold high office in Saudi Arabia because not only is he born into a kind of liberal wing of the ruling family, but there is foreign blood in it. His mother is Lebanese, was Lebanese, the daughter of former uh, Lebanese prime minister. Um, the thing is that Western media seem to be fascinated with Al-Walid because of things like him supporting women's right to drive, the fact that he is a vocal opponent of Islamist militancy um, and various activities of his um, enterprises, and the fact that he aligns with US foreign policy. He told Fox Business that he thought the way bin Laden was killed, which was almost exactly a year ago, uh, was good, correct, and any person who disputes that is not a human being. Um, his recent, um, his media investments, I say recent, they're not, um, some of these are not fantastically recent. Um, the Twitter stake got a lot of attention, but actually there's a lot, you know, we're talking about transnational and national, there's a lot of investment at home in Saudi Arabia. But also, think about it, Al Arab is going to be based in Bahrain. That's only recently been announced. So this channel is going to focus on Saudi news, first of all, and then Arab news. It's going to be kept separate from the other investments, probably because it's not going to make money. 
is actually going to compete with Sky Arabia, in which Al Walid also has a stake through News Corporation. And it's going to be based in Bahrain at a critical moment in Bahraini politics. Seems very much like um, moral support to the Sunni ruling elite which poses big questions about freedom of expression in this new channel. Um, and um, I've listed in the uh, slide various other um, uh, investments, uh, all in Saudi Arabia. And to finish on with his statements on political openness, um, I'm just going to restrict myself to um, an interview he did with um, CNBC um, about a month after the toppling of um, Mubarak. So March 11 was designated as a day of rage in Saudi Arabia. Um, and there were Shiite um, protesters in, um, in parts of the, in, in, in part of the country, but in the main cities of Riyadh and um, Jeddah, people stayed at home because there was such a strong police presence. So CNBC interviews Al-Walid as if he is a trusted source on what's going on effect effectively on the Saudi street. And, um, and they introduce him saying he's been outspoken about the region's need for reform. And asked about the Arab Spring, he says, we hope that this thing is not contagious and does not spread at all. And I'm taking that translation from Arab News, which al Walid partly owns. Um, he said he'd prayed with King Abdullah personally on that day. He'd gone out and he hadn't seen anybody on the streets. And then he quotes Obama. Um, to say that Saudi Arabia internal stability is crucial for the global oil market and that Saudi politics are very different from Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. He says the day of rage, so-called, is a tempest in a teacup and we should actually be calling it the day of allegiance to King Abdullah. And unbelievably, uh, Maria Bartiromo, who's the, Bartiromo, who's the uh, CNBC interviewer, replies to that comment. She says, yeah, that's a great way to put it, Day of Allegiance to King Abdullah. And she goes on to narrow the issues of Saudi politics down to women's right to drive. And when al Walid says later in the interview that the Bahraini king and his able crown prince will be able to solve Bahrain's problems very amicably, the interviewer just moves on to other issues and doesn't pick up on that at all. And in his biography, al Walid tells some um, Khan, modernization, yes, westernization, never. Um, there's not much time. I'm going to race through Sir Wiris just on the same kind of four headings. But the interesting thing is that we get the same narrative of the self-made man. He tells Time magazine in February 2011, I like my success to be attributed only to my hard work, my honesty, my reputation, my background, my education, and my family. I don't like easy money. It doesn't taste right. How can you celebrate your success when you know you took a shortcut? It's just not my style. Well, let it not go unnoticed that Naguib's father, Onsi, is also a multi-billionaire. He was one of Egypt's biggest contractors who survived for nine years after the, um, under Nasser until he was nationalized, his business was nationalized in 61. He went off to Libya but then came back after Sadat's open door policy, the Infitah. Um, and by that time, Naguib was 22 years old, so he's happy to tell interviewers that he was earning his money making, um, selling carjacks when he was 23. But actually, he joined the Oriscom group um, very shortly after the return to Egypt. He distributed IT equipment, invested in the country's first internet service provider in 1994, and there are plenty of analysts of Egyptian political economy who see the arrangement between Oriskom and Mubarak as a straightforward case of cronyism, um, in, including John Sfakianakis. I mean, I, I won't take time over that quote. I mean, um, I've put in the slide that in the 2000s, uh, Sir Wiris was in partnership with not with like former elite, Nasser's grandson, and also the son of Safwat Sharif, uh, Mubarak's information minister. On the image building, um, 
I found a fascinating um, eight-page advertising supplement in Foreign Policy from 2009, which is all about freedom of speech on the basis that Nagib Sawiris's firms sell mobile phones, and mobile phones equate with freedom of expression. Um, I mean, it's somewhat disingenuous, isn't it, to say that North Koreans can speak freely on their mobiles, because um, North Korea is one of the, the, the countries in, in, involved. And in, in that supplement, there's an interview with uh, Sir Weiris saying, oh, you know, the fact that, the, that North Koreans now have mobile phones means that the government has given them freedom of expression. Almost worse to that effect. Um, I mean, it's also somewhat disingenuous given that, um, you know, Moby Neal was one of the companies that suspended internet and mobile phones during the last days of Mubarak. Um, so Weiris can't hope for high office in Egypt because he's a Christian um, and uh, it would be hard for him to um, get a senior political role, and that tends to make him a favorite of Western media. Um, interestingly, Time magazine drew a link between his self-proclaimed openness and his Christianity. They actually wrote, the openness may come in part because the Sawiris clan belongs to Egypt's Coptic Christian minority. I mean, he got massive publicity for retweeting um, the Minnie and Mickey Mouse images, you know, in, in face veil and, uh, and beard and such like, which was kind of taken very badly in Egypt, but is seen as a sign of like minority status, rebelliousness in the Western media. And he makes out that, that this was a big mistake. But you wonder, because, um, you know, is he really such a bad tech? Uh, tactician. Um, I just got two more slides left and then that's, that's it. Yeah. Oh, okay? Okay. Um, so the landscape of um, Oscom Telecom Holdings is very global. I mentioned North Korea, Russia, Switzerland, Syria, and so on. High risk acquisitions in Bangladesh and Zimbabwe. Most of the assets now have been merged into Vimplecom, which is the world's sixth largest mobile phone company. But again, when you look at the media investments as opposed to the kind of general telecoms investments, we shouldn't underestimate how much has been invested in Egypt. So um, not only the Free Egyptians Party, which has created since uh, the uprising, but the, um, I mean, I've put things in reverse chronological order there, um, um, OTV was launched in 2007 and expanded um, in, in, in stages since then. So this is an, a, a kind of an independent uh, Egyptian uh, network that is available only by satellite and it's been one of the most um, outspoken, um, which is a lot to do with the people who work for it <laughs> rather than the person who owns it. Um, uh, <clears throat> He's a shareholder, again, in an independent newspaper and increased his shares um, since 2005, the point at the, which Egypt had its first multi-candidate presidential elections. Um, and I've mentioned also his investment in uh, Iraq after the American invasion, um, both in uh, TV channel and in um, mobile phones, but he withdrew in 2007 from that. Statements on political openness. Well, I, I mentioned to you um, uh, that the supplement that spoke about giving the world a voice, um, and I mentioned the, the North Korean example. Um, now the North Korean government lets its citizens use cell phones, which is an act of democratization. The authorities are extending one of the fundamental human rights, the right to free speech. Well, if we saw, if anybody was following, you know, the death of the previous dictator of um, Kim, Kim Jong-un, in, yeah, I, I get mixed up with. I haven't written it down, but the but the and the the takeover of the new uh, the 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 demise of the 
Yeah, there's the, there's the great leader and the dear leader, and then there's the new leader. So the demise of the dear leader, I mean, if anyone had watched the scenes, I think there might be issues around questions of freedom of expression. Um, <clears throat> and again, square that with um, Moby Neal um, complying with the, the order um, to, to cut mobile phone lines on 27th of January last year. And I also have um, <clears throat> some difficulty reconciling um, the rhetoric about freedom of expression with his complacency about Mubarak's presidency, um, describing you know, all the good aspects of it, and, and then saying, but we were all afraid to speak. So my conclusion, oops, sorry. <clears throat> if I go, will I go back? Yes. My conclusion. <clears throat> Both Al Walid and Sawiris built up their um, privilege. They th built up their wealth through privilege in a national environment of monopoly capitalism. They were beneficiaries of a political system and are not interested. I mean, it makes sense that they're not interested in turning that system upside down, especially given the demographics of Saudi Arabia and Egypt, where you have this growing market of young consumers. This interest in preserving the status quo of monopoly capitalism is, tends to get hidden by the international image-making process, whereby their minority status or so-called reformist characteristics are the ones that are always foregrounded. And the thing about corporate arrangements in Egypt and Saudi Arabia is that they are less transparent than those in the US and, and Europe. So both moguls and their conglomerates are able to exploit that less, lesser transparency in nurturing these transnational links with media, entrepreneurs, and politicians outside the region. Thus, the national and the transnational interact in a way that, I would say, depends on borders those very laws and regulations that provide them with that lack of transparency. So the jurisdictional borders that allow aspects of corporate behavior to continue and to remain hidden. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, would you mind changing places with uh, Professor Hamid Arso? This was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Hamid Ersoy from uh, Radio and Television uh, Supreme Council, Rutuk. He's actually the first presenter from uh, Rutuk uh, in this uh, colloquium. And he's going to talk about uh, Rutuk in the international arena. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think I must admit that I love to s address such an audience at this time of the day because I see the faces fully alerted and ready to pick up any message I give now. So I'll try to summarize how Rutuk works in the international arena. This is our web page where you can see the activities at national and international level and you can follow the developments in Turkish and also in English. So this is the web page where you can follow our activities and here you have the uh, international activities uh, title where you can see all the activities there. Uh, just to be very brief about the uh, international role of the RUTUK uh, from where it emerges, uh, as you see in all countries, Ministry of Foreign Affairs have the uh, major uh, mandate to trace the international activities and to represent the country. But when it comes to the media, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs delegated its power to RUTUK to follow the international symposiums, conferences, and also to express the national standoff point uh, in Council of Europe, in the EU, in UNESCO, uh, and in also whenever it comes to the freedom of media 
or pr protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions and so on, then uh, always uh, Rutuk represent the country on the table. And finally, we have the last uh, development. As my uh, earlier previous colleagues mentioned, there is a huge change in international relations uh, in the field of media. Now we have the various international broadcasting forums like EPRA, uh, MNRI, and BRAF, and finally IBRAF. So I will just give a very brief uh, explanation about each of them. When it comes to Council of Europe, here, this is our web page of the Council of Europe where if you click the media uh, section then you will see the developments in every country in the field of media. But mainly uh, Council of uh, Europe works through, uh, on the, in the field of media through CDMC which is Media and New Communication Services Committee. There we have the working groups, and Rutuk always represent Turkey there. Uh, in the last period, there were four major expertise groups. IS group, Information Society group, Media Diversity group, Public Service Broadcasting group, and also Freedom and Expression, Freedom of Expression and Information in times of crisis, like war or terror and so on. But the current uh, shape of the expertise groups is slightly changing. We have a new media which is more related to the internet actually. And the PSB group turned into public media service governance. And we also have cross-border internet group. And finally we have the neighboring right which is dealing with the intellectual property rights. So Rutuk usually uh, forms its national uh, standpoint and attend such meetings where they formulate, they present their national view, which is already formulated uh, within Rutuk. And when we are acting on behalf of the state there, normally, which is expected to be conducted by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the way they formulate their decisions or the international legal text is through three uh, formats. One of them is resolution, the second is declarations, and the final one is recommendations. But normally, each country is expected to implement all those international texts, regardless of their names. For example, resolutions are more binding, but recommendations as can be seen it is a recommendation, but still it usually contains the guiding principles for the broadcasting regulators. And this is the web page of European Union where you can see the 35 chapters which are very popular in Turkey. And you can see the developments in each field, but Rutuk is more to do with the harmonization of the Turkish legislation with the international legislation, but namely the EU legislation or EU aki. But also, uh, we follow the international developments in order to import the a kind of technological developments as well into uh, the national practice like digitalization and so on. And also in the EU we attend the contact committee which is held twice a year and also the working group meeting uh, which are held in Brussels every year. We used to have the TTT standing committee of Transfrontier Television Convention uh, as uh, the president of Rutuk mentioned in the morning, uh, this convention is the main international legal text which has the bind binding power for all the member states and Turkey is also a party to it. So uh, we are, Rutuk is responsible for the implementation, this TTT committee, standing committee, is responsible for the implementation of the convention, but Rutuk is responsible for representation and also for the implementation of the principles of the convention in the country. 
And this committee used to meet twice a year. I use, used to because there is a recent development there. Uh, I will deal with it in a minute. Turkey held almost every administrative post at the committee until last moment. We were represented and we contributed actively to all the text which were shaped up by the expert committees. For example, one of the most important one was this. Turkey was one of the seven countries actively took part to draft the Transfrontier Television Convention together with Germany, France, England, Poland, Austria, and Switzerland, which were responsible to draft a new, updated, and revised, and also aligned with the Audiovisual Media Services Directive of the European Union. However, when the Lisbon Treaty was agreed, finally, approved by all the countries, then the EU said Council of Europe is no longer authorized or has the right to make any legislation in the field where the EU has the uh, initial power or has the power to make the legislation. So now, because they have audiovisual media services directive, which regulates several uh, aspects of broadcasting, they said Council of Europe has no power to draft such a treaty or convention. So it was left there, the process interrupted, and TTT was halted since then. Uh, Rutuk also has taken the responsibility to conduct the negotiation with the EU for certain chapters to prepare Turkey for the full membership to the EU. Uh, and therefore, it followed eight chapters among 35 chapters, and we took active part during the negotiation to open up them for the negotiation or to have a closing uh, negotiation in, in the end. But we are more active in the, especially in uh, two of them. One is information society and media, which is the chapter 10, and the second judiciary and fundamental rights. Those are the two we are leading uh, the negotiations with the EU, but we have partial role in other chapters as well. And finally, I am coming to the forums where we don't have the binding uh, decisions, but we usually come together and exchange the views and opinions on certain problems or aspects of broadcasting. Uh, because of the transfrontier characteristic of the broadcasting. And uh, also, we usually exchange our experience uh, by having study visits or through some other uh, bilateral or multilateral relations. International Regulators Forum is one of the uh, popular forums where both the telecommunication and broadcasting people come together. Uh, and they have very popular meetings every year in most, in some most popular destinations like Hong Kong, Dubai, and Doha, and so on and so forth. So no one can stop himself or herself from attending. Uh, they are very popular meetings. And the second is the EPRA, European Platform of Regulatory Authorities. This is uh, also the second most popular uh, forum. I'll go through them. I just have one slide for each, just to get to know them a bit closer. For example, EPRA was established in April 1995, and it has 41 members with 49 regulators, because some countries have more than one regulators. One responsible for, for example, licensing, the other is responsible for the content monitoring and so on. And the platform has a meeting every six months in a different country to make it more attractive for the participants. And also, this forum, like uh, IRF, doesn't have any binding uh, power, but they work on voluntary basis because everybody has the potential to benefit from the activities there. Turkey hosted the 20th EPRA meeting in 2004 in Istanbul, which is still very fresh in the minds of everyone. Whenever we meet, they thank for the 
uh, excellent arrangement of the organization in Istanbul. The Mediterranean network of regulatory authorities, this was established in 1997, two years later. It has 17 countries with 19 regulators currently. And it has once a year meetings, but the meeting has two phases. One, a meeting of experts. The first two days, meeting of experts. The second day is the meeting of the presidents. And that also doesn't have any binding power in, in its decisions or recommendations. And we were the president uh, of the network last year uh, in 2010, and we had the meeting in Izmir. Uh, the meeting of expert was in Izmir, and the meeting of the president was held in Istanbul. Braf. Well, when we attended such meetings and we saw that they are very beneficial, we said, why not to have our own forum? And we decide, decided to create a forum uh, within the umbrella of the uh, Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization. So I uh, was a lecturer of international relations, uh, writing a book on uh, regional cooperation versus globalization. So uh, assuming that or claiming that the regional organizations are the umbrella by which you can protect your national interest against globalization. So this was my theory. And I said, why not to have such a regional cooperation to defend our regional values? And I prepared the project and presented it in Kiev to the, com the committee, relevant committee of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. And the project was accepted. And then we held a meeting in Istanbul in June 2007, when we declared the joint declaration that we created the BRAF, Black Sea Regulatory Authorities Forum. And the forum has meeting once a year in a different country. The last one was in Tbilisi, Georgia. And this year, in two weeks later, in two weeks' time, We'll go to Albania in Tirana. We will have our annual meeting there. And, oops, sorry. IBRAF, I, our uh, vice president is here. He bought an uh, iPhone for each member of RUTUK. And I said we had BRAF, so why not to have a similar IBRAF like iPhone? So this is a uh, regulatory authorities of Islamic countries. When we saw the benefits of the BRAF in the Black Sea Basin, then we said this is a called spillover effect. I said, why not to have the similar impact in a larger geography? Then I uh, prepared another uh, project. We proposed the project to the or OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries. We presented the project in 2010 in Dakar, Senegal, in the meeting of the ministers of uh, information. And once they approved the project, then we held a meeting in November 2011. Again, in that meeting, we declared the joint declaration, uh, declaring that we have the IBRAF, this is a necessity and beneficial for all the national interests of the members of the OIC, uh, including uh, uh, an observer member, which is Cypriot Turkish state, as it is registered in the charter of the OIC. The forum has a meeting once a year. It started to roll on. And uh, this year, we will have the meeting in October in Jidda. Next year, uh, last year was in Istanbul. It has the similar structure with all other forums. And as I said, we held the meeting in 2011. Now we will have the second meeting in Jidda for 2012. We also have some bilateral cooperation protocols. 
between uh, Rütük, I mean the Turkish Broadcasting Regulatory Authority, and other states like Cypriot, Turkish state, Azerbaijan, Macedonia, Moldova. And through such protocols, we arrange the certificate programs. We invite or upon their application for the study visits to Rütük, we, gra we grant or issue the licensing and monitoring certificates to the attendees or to the participants. So far, we have we received several experts from Macedonia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, and uh, Cypriot Turkish state. And now we have for this year we have planned to receive the group of experts from Kosovo and Moldova as well. And as especially one point is very crucial. Ukraine and Azerbaijan groups visited Rutuk uh, upon recommendation of the European Commission because they applied to the European Commission asking for the expertise. They said, well, we, we better send you to Turkey where they have the better way of monitoring and uh, licensing system. So it is better to have a, such a regional expertise in Ankara. So they were directed to Rutuk uh, through European Commission, and the European Commission itself sponsored all the projects. And finally, we also exchange the know-how that we have so far regarding two fields. One is the how to create a broadcasting regulatory authority. The second is about how to create an international organization and run, run it smoothly. So SURF, Central European Regulatory Regulators Forum, uh, invited me personally on behalf of BRAF to explain how BRAF was established and how we can create a similar forum for the Central European countries. So I went to Hungary, Budapest, where I made a presentation and afterwards uh, they also created such a forum as the fifth in Europe. And also the Cypriot uh, uh, Turkish state has YYK, let's say, uh, it is Yayin Yüksek Kurulu, that is uh, the, their national broadcasting regulatory authority. And we, also, all, we always guide them how to make a new law, how to create a new bylaw, and so on. So that's an example how uh, a regulator can be created and uh, run without problems. So my final words, as seen from the work has been done so far, these are just some humble steps taken by Rutuk in parallel with the global Turkish foreign policy initiatives pursued by the Minister of Foreign Affairs so far. Just to remind us all, the foreign trade between Turkey and Africa in 2002 was only $4 billion, and it is $17 billion in 2011. So it shows how the speed, the pace of the globalization of Turkish foreign policy. Uh, so we believe that no national institution like Rutuk has the luxury not to keep up with such a global development accomplished in the diplomatic and economic fields in Turkey. And thank you for the patience at this time of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I guess we can move on to questions, if you have any questions. I think this session was quite important in, in the sense that it reminds us, it, it was a very vivid reminder of how important uh, political and economic uh, relations uh, and dynamics are behind this uh, evolution of uh, media and media conglomerates. Uh, because as far as I'm aware, most of the research is mainly on the reception level and uh, we're mainly interested in how uh, transnational media or global media has an impact on cultural uh, transformation, so on and so forth. But uh, as I've said, this, this uh, panel was a very uh, valuable reminder about the the, the economic and political uh, transformations that are taking place behind all this uh, media evolution, let's say. Any, any questions? Yes, please. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I have. Uh, I have actually two questions, one for Norm Sakra and one for Dr. Hamtars. Um, I would like to start with the Dr. Ars uh, with Dr. Arsoy. Uh, what are the implications of being a member of that many organizations, international organizations and forums on Turkish broadcasting policy today mm -hmm. in Turkey? And my uh, question for Dr. Sark is, uh, when you, you know, say the um, investments of uh, Alawi, uh, do I? Al-Walid, Al-Walid. Yeah, Al-Walid family. Uh, do you see parallelism between the structural changes of capitalism and their investment policy uh, uh, in general? <coughs> Ladies first. I'm not sure I completely understood the question. So, because the, 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 the ruling family, the, when you say the family, you mean the Al Saud? Because he's part of the Saudi ruling families, which is like thousands and thousands of people. Yeah, uh, I would like to elaborate. You started that they invested first the real estate and then they moved to um, uh, banking, finance, and then it moves to media, you know, they uh, invested in finance scapes. Okay, and then right. they moved to mediascapes and then invested there, which okay. you know tells me something about the structural changes in capitalism okay. during the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Now, do you see any yes. connection there? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we're picking up on the paper on the conglomerate strategies and the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, the. Um, I'm just trying to think. The, the, uh, Al Walid is a big sort of entry into media investments took place in the, um, 1997, uh, which is a moment exactly when these kind of critical changes that we heard about from Nikos were were were, were taking place. And um, um, and th but they are clearly. I mean, th there is a clear sort of you know subplot there in the sense of having, um, having leverage over certain um, aspects of coverage. I mean, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the shareholding in News Corporation, which dates from that time, um, has, um, it's not just an economic um, uh, objective. There's a clear sort of political objective in the sense that Al Walid is then able to say, look, you know, when Fox News was reporting, you know, the, 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 the riots in the Parisian suburbs in 2005, and they were saying, you know, Muslim riots, Al Walid is able to sort of pick up the phone and change it to, um, you know, sub, uh, suburb riots or, or, or whatever the, you know, the, 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 there was a ch the ch exact change, I can't remember actually, of, of hand, but I'm just prompted by, by your question. But uh, <coughs> it's clear that the, um, when you're building um, an empire, as massive as one with 18 billion dollars worth of assets, that the, the kind of the international presentation of it is quite critical. So, besides the um, kind of economic benefits of having these stakes, there is also a, a, a clear sort of political spin-off as well. If I got you rightly, you asked about the implication of such forums on uh, Turkish broadcasting policy. Yes, it's an excellent question. The spirit of this question is the main motivation behind the cre creating such forums, actually. By having such forums, we are internationalized. We get more transparent. We get more involved in interna uh, with international developments. One of the most crucial result of such forums uh, or having such forums is to have a fully harmonized or fully aligned Turkish broadcasting uh, law today. In, on, th on 3rd of March 2011, we had a fully aligned uh, Turkish broadcasting law with the Audiovisual Media Services Directive of the EU. So that made the Turkish law fully international, fully transparent, and fully democratized. In the first article of the law, it says this law aims to create an atmosphere which is f fully, which guarantees the freedom of expression 
and uh, freedom of information. So that's just to start with. So if you follow the article by article, you will see that we have an, in, an international law which, has, which goes beyond the national borders. It doesn't have the limited or restricted um, articles which are not uh, compatible with the human rights uh, standards. So the, the Convention on the European Convention on Human Rights is part of our law now by certain articles which are embedded there. And also, as it was mentioned by the President of Rutuk in the morning, this, the cooperation is a must for the broadcasting sector because it's, I mean, by definition, it's by its transfrontier characteristics, you are bound to be together. You are bound to have such forums where you can practically easily solve the problems which may rise, like interference of the television or radio between Turkey and Greece, television between Turkey and Bulgaria and Romania. They had serious problems, for example, in Bulgaria. It caused a serious diplomatic uh, problem. And at president levels, the president of Turkey, Abdullah Gül, and the president of Bulgaria came together to solve the, this interference problem. So by having such forums, now you can easily avoid all these diplomatic maneuvers and having one expert from Bulgaria, one expert from Turkey in the forthcoming meeting in Tirana, for example, they'll say, look, these are the, your interference areas and this, these are ours. So such and such broadcasters are really disturbed by your uh, television, so please let's take our measures to stop. It's so easy. So in addition to such practical benefits, you always benefit from one another when you come together in such forums. And we indeed benefit a lot. So you improve your standards, you improve your understanding, you improve your practices, because all, for example, audiovisual media services directive of the European Union created new concepts like product placement, like numerous uh, new concepts. So now every nation tries to implement them in the way they understand, which is sometimes not fully in line with the spirit of the directive. So when you come together, everybody makes its his own or her own command, and then you come to the conclusion that, well, the mainstream understanding is this, so we have to change our legal practice, uh, national practice. And then we converge together to the more common uh, line of understanding. So there are lots of uh, benefits of having such forums. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think. I uh, think. Uh, I think one has to understand there is, that there is a fundamental paradox uh, <coughs> Yes, I'm saying that I believe that there is a fundamental paradox in relation to, uh, to, to international legislation concerning uh, the media uh, and uh, one has to take this into account on the one hand the International Convention of, on Human Rights, signed by the United Nations, signed by the European Union, states clearly that freedom of information is a fundamental human right, a fundamental human right, like the right to live uh, or, the or the right to have a job. Of course, what happens in practice is different, as we know in many countries, but according to international conventions, Freedom of expression and freedom of information is a, human, is a fundamental human right that should be available to everyone, to every, to, to every human being, because otherwise this human being cannot function in society. Uh, on the other hand, uh, information and media is an integral and very important pillar of power. Uh, a political power in, in every country and uh, in international relations as well. This means that uh, uh, 
nation states uh, have uh, retained the uh, the the uh, uh, the right for themselves to decide about how their media are going to operate. Uh, that's why uh, efforts, even within the European Union, in a in a smaller group than the international community, to harmonize media policies have failed. So within the European Union, there is not a single policy concerning media. Policies uh, are relegated to, to media countries. Therefore, what it exists are groups uh, of, of experts and, and uh, international organizations that talk about the issues and try to develop some ideas, but the implementation of these uh, are the, the right uh, of, of the individual state. Okay, so there is this fundamental contradiction, and this explains, uh, up to a point, I think, uh, why uh, there are all these uh, meetings and groups of experts, etc., etc., uh, and constant deliberation and constant discussion, because every effort to uh, create a binding legal framework uh, ha have failed, all these efforts, and it's simply a matter of, of trying to develop consensus and follow developments through discussions. Uh, is this a follow-up? Okay, well, well Jen, uh, Professor uh, Sack had a question. Let's, let's take that first. Um, it's okay, I'll defer because it's not important. And I've got part of my answer anyway, I think. <laughs> okay. okay. I can um, come back to it if it's okay. time. Uh, you, you, you were talking about the latest forum, which is the Islamic Countries Broadcasting Regulators Association Forum something. I, uh, Ibrav. Ibrav. Yes, Ibrav. Uh, Ibrav. Now, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's very recent. You had the meeting in November, as far as I can remember. Yes. We had the joint declaration in November. Yeah. And we had the meeting in Gabon two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And I was there to get the approval of 57 ministers from all the members. Okay. Now, now in, in, in most of Europe and, and this part of the world, uh, we are already, you know, we already have a very basic sort of convention, mm -hmm. talking about the cross-border uh, uh, convention uh, from, from the 90s, which, which covers much more than the European Union, of course, how many countries are now part of it, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe 27 members? 27, right? Uh, no, no, no. I mean the uh, Council of Europe's convention. Oh, 32 members are signatory of the convention of the Transfrontier Transfrontier Television Convention, convention yes. yes. But it's, it's more or less the basic uh, legal text uh -huh. that is working for t t uh, transnational uh -huh. television, at least, yes. let's, let's say. So, but uh, there's nothing uh, of, uh, of uh, that sort for the rest uh, of, the world. of the world. Yes, it's, it's quite unique, actually. Yes. It's covering an area much wider than the European Union. It covers uh -huh. Russia as uh -huh. well, for example. Russia is also part of it, right? As far as I can remember. So, now, uh, this, this, this IBRAF thing is very interesting because uh, currently there's, there's no such convention, uh -huh. for example, in the Middle East. So any television broadcaster from Syria can broadcast to the whole Middle East. And someone from... Uh, Saudi Arabia, which they mm -hmm. already do actually, set up a TV channel and then broadcast to the whole Middle East. Now, I'm sure in that regulators meeting you mm -hmm. had, uh, there were complaints about uh, how other, uh, how, how broadcasters from uh, other countries are uh, broadcasting <coughs> via satellite freely and mm -hmm. we should mm -hmm. be doing mm -hmm. something about this. Yeah. I mean, were there any talks like this in that IBRAF meeting? Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I should admit that this is one of, uh, this area will be one of the most popular area where we will have the expert groups working on it. Because so far, as you said, 
there is no such a standardization there is no such a legal legally binding text like the convention on transfrontier television within council of europe so this is a fresh area this is a new area where we will have a huge responsibility to at least have the minimum requirements of the transfrontier broadcasting among the islamic countries as you said this an area is which is untouched so far so we will have a sort of text which are not binding but a kind of recommendation or decisions we are not a diplomatic uh, international organization we are completely voluntary a voluntary based organization a forum but once you come together and once you address to the core of the problem then everybody is ready to cooperate for the benefit of all so that will be our first item on agenda in the forthcoming meeting after we have the founding charter in Jitte, which is already prepared and i think in 2013 uh, we can invite you as well to see how serious issue what you have just mentioned and we will start dealing with it just just to mention i would much prefer the, uh, the, it, 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 if it would stay the way it is now I, I don't want any more international regulation don't take me wrong but uh, um the t and 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 as an as an uh, uh, addition to that, were there any, any complaints about the Turkish series? Were they talking about how Turkish series are doing this and that mm. in their Com country? Yes, the complaints were individual, not as a national complaint, but there were certain personalities who were more sensitive ideologically from this point and that point. So they expressed such complaints during the informal meetings, not during the formal meeting. During the formal me meeting, we try to draft a joint declaration to draw up the main standards of such and such forum. And now we will have the chart, founding charter in Jitte, and after that we will start to do the real work. Now, just, just, just to point out something, when you say this is a voluntary organization, so there's no binding uh, legislative yes. power. It's not an intergovernmental, it yes. is inter-regulator. <coughs> yes, but uh, most of the regulators that we are talking about, apart from RUTUK, which is an uh -huh. independent authority, uh, most of the regulators we are talking about are actually ministries, from what I know. Right? So they, they are part of the legislative and administrative mechanism. So it's uh -huh. not like RUTUK, they will uh -huh. have legislative uh -huh. power. So what you say is actually very important for uh, Islamic countries' broadcasting system, especially for Middle East, which uh -huh. is so far uncontrolled, yes, but it's very vibrant uh -huh. because, you know, it's uh -huh. free. Uh -huh. uh, so this will, this will have some, some great, great implications on, especially news, news channels like uh -huh. uh, El Arabiya and the others. RUTUK probably is the only, I'm not I mean, it may be too much, but I think it's the only independent, accountable uh, regulator in the field of broadcasting among 58 members. Uh, therefore, it, will, it has the leading uh, position in this process. And that's why we initiated the process. Uh, and we expect them, probably, we expect the ministries which are playing the same function uh, to invite us to benefit from the technical assistance, how to create such an independent broadcasting regulator. This is the process that we are expecting from the Islamic countries now. And probably we'll start receiving the experts from there, coming and getting, just seeing how it works, how it functions, to see how licensing is being made, how monitoring is being made, how the reports of violations are prepared and so on. Uh, we have a huge work to be done actually. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll have, we have a question from Professor Sack as well. This is, this is something very... It's, it's related, related to... Field, to you know, um, yes, related to this. Because you say the area is, I mean, of the effort uh, is untouched. I mean, I'm reminded of the Arab Satellite Charter of February 2008, which was a very serious attempt to do something by no means voluntary. And, um, I mean, being 
kind of pessimistic about these things, one can see why countries that want to take an authoritarian approach to regulation would want to come together in a forum that is legitimized by the presence of Turkey with its independent regulator, but because there will be strength in numbers whereby um, a, a kind of a, an approach to regulation that is very far from the, the European Convention and so on as far away as you can get, will be um, entrenched simply by force of people coming together and, and encouraging each other. And it seems hard to see how this could have a liberalizing effect rather than uh, the reverse. Uh, in the meeting in Gabon, in Libreville, two weeks ago, uh, we, had, we prepared a resolution which approves the establishment of IBRAF, in, uh, which was uh, declared in Istanbul. We had already prepared a resolution and presented, put into the formal agenda of the meeting. But in the meeting, we discussed the issue, and the ministers came to the conclusion that, well, the Rotu case seems very successful, so why not to make a call, official call, on behalf of the uh, ministers to Islamic countries, the member countries of the OIC, which don't have an independent regulator like Rotary. So that call was, was added to the resolution which was prepared by us at the beginning. So that shows that they were convinced that every country must have such a regulator, otherwise we will have more and more problems. So that is an indication that at least convinced me to be more optimistic. I, I would just point to the membership of uh, the Moroccan regulator, ACA, yeah, and the Jordanian Audiovisual um, yeah, Commission in Riyam, in, the, in yeah. what you were calling the MRNRA, the, the Réseau des Instances Régulatoires. Okay, which kind of, they are not in any way democratically mandated because they are, um, I mean, because of the way budget controls and lines of authority work in those countries, in, in Morocco and Jordan in particular. And yet they are operating alongside democratically mandated regulatory bodies, um, which kind of gives us a sort of a complicity to sort of non-democratic procedures. And I, I've always wondered, how did Morocco and Jordan manage to become part of this forum in the first place, given their, um, given their genesis or their... Uh, yeah. you, are talking, you are touching the real problems in the uh, field. I totally agree with you. Uh, you see, the first uh, step is to have an, a separate body which deals with the problems of the broadcasting independent of the politicians or the government and so on. So Hakka, Lebanese, Jordanian cases are such examples. They, have they were just separated from the ministry. They have a, in a separate, physical, physically independent, not mentally, I mean. So physically, they have a separate building. They have a separate regulator. But we like to believe that these separate buildings will also make them mentally, legally independent in a matter of five or 10 years time. We don't expect them to become democratized, fully independent, autonomous regulators in a matter of few years. Of course, we are aware of that problem. Thank you. Yes, Alto, yes, please. I have one question for uh, Professor Sacker and one for Professor Leanders. Um, I want you to elaborate a bit on um, Al Jazeera. Um, if you think about Al Jazeera and its connection with the Qatari family, and if you consider from the same perspective of national regulation and national existence of um, a, 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 a transnational organization legitimizes operations on a transnational level. Is, is this framework applicable to Al Jazeera, considering that Al Jazeera will be, um, they are trying to start broadcast in Turkey? That's a question mark. And secondly, about the case of 
if there is a transnational connection regarding the media sphere in general between Greece and Cyprus, can you elaborate a bit on this? Because we talked about Turkey's proximate um, expansion to the markets surrounding countries, and language is one of these things. So between Greece and Cyprus, you have such a connection, at least on the language level and historical um, levels. So what about the media um, sphere in, the, in that sense? Thanks. Lady first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question about the uh, Qatari ruling family because um, there are strong analogies in terms of the international asset base of the Qatari ruling family. I mean, if you look at the holdings and the increasing uh, purchases that are going on uh, in Europe um, and elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, you need a kind of an information frame with, with, within which to make these purchases seem safe and, like, un, you know, unthreatening and uncontroversial. And if you did the same exercise of looking at the mechanics of image building for the Emir of Qatar and his, in particular, his wife, Sheikha Moza, who is presented as, you know, champion of women's rights, uh, you know, they're, they're a modernizing couple, they're the modern, they're the Medici of the Gulf in the 21st centuries, uh, 21st century, um, and, and where does that kind of, um, you know, media framing come from? Um, I, I mean, I actually did some work recently for, for, for a completely different project on um, representations of um, Arab diaspora in Europe on Al Jazeera, and uh, it is, there is, where there is kind of, you know, editorial policy is to keep it decidedly favorable. So issues about, um, I mean, obviously in news and so on, there's a limit to how much you can control, but in documentaries and so on, there is, you can find emphasis on um, um, highly satisfactory, big contributions by Arab diaspora in European countries, and in a way that, Kind of aligns with the, the the narrative that suits the you know the, the Qatari ruling family project in so far as there is one of um, of, of establishing Qatar as a as a kind of a, a legitimate player on the, on the world stage. And when we say Qatar, you know it's it's. It's, it's, a, it's a tiny, tiny city-state with n no real kind of, you know, mechanisms of accountability that we would recognize as, as such. So, um, so I think, yeah, there's, there's interesting parallels to be drawn with, uh, with the other examples I gave. Yes. Uh, yes, there is a link uh, between Greek media and media in Cyprus. Uh, mainly uh, in television, so uh, big um, TV channels uh, in Greece like Mega Antenna uh, expanded uh, into Cyprus, created uh, channels, uh, companies and channels with the, the same names. Of course, they have some local product as well. Uh, news are locally produced, but they also broadcast some programs that are produced in, in Greece, uh, f uh, films and TV series and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, there are other TV channels as well, like Sigma, which is uh, owned by local entrepreneurs, Cypriot entrepreneurs, but uh, uh, g uh, TV channels, Greek TV channels are, are, have a, are very uh, influential in, you can say, uh, have a large share of, this, of, of the market in, in Cyprus, in the Republic of Cyprus. Um, so internationalization basically occurred through television, not in the case of newspapers uh, or, or, or in other uh, fields. Uh, television uh, also, these, these channels uh, were also uh, uh, internationalized their activities in some other countries, for instance in Bulgaria, Antenna owned the, for a number of years the biggest uh, TV channel in, in Bulgaria called Nova, and there was also uh, some internationalization from uh, uh, d um, periodical companies that uh, applied this principle of cross-border publication. Um, 
So yes, these phenomena are present. By the way, we have very close cooperation with Greece as well, within BRAF. Eva Demi Evi Demiri is the national contact person on behalf of the Greek regulator. And also we have quite close cooperation with the uh, Cypriot Broadcasting uh, Authority within RIRM, within the Mediterranean network as well. So uh, you don't need the language uh, I mean, relative uh, relations in order to have the cooperation because the problems are very much similar. That's why you can easily cooperate. And in fact, you, you are bound to cooperate in the broadcasting field because otherwise the Turkish radios will be listened by the Greeks on the islands, even in the main island. Or we are, I think, easily able to listen the Greek radios here. So normally such things shouldn't take place. But within BRAF, I think we will somehow solve this problem in Tirana and probably in the following year. We'll come together, create a technical committee, and they will deal with such interference. So cooperation is a must. Thank you. Yes, any other questions? Comments? Are we hungry? Getting hungry? Okay. Thank you very much again for all our presenters.